Hi everybody, welcome back to a Life of Education's podcast. Myself and Caroline again, and this time we're with Tom Waldron from the UK. Um, Tom's over teaching a course. Uh, you are a, we'll get this right, biomechanics master trainer. That's it, nice. And what was the second thing? Uh, and then uh, Franklin Methods. Oh, Franklin Methods, Methods. Mm-hmm. yeah, sorry. Franklin See, Methods. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so you're teaching here. Uh, do you want to just explain to people listening how you ended up in the world of biomechanics? Yeah, I don't know really. Yeah, it's, it's a funny one. So like I was just really obsessed. I was really into athletics. So I used to do a sprint team when I was younger. I used to do loads of running. Um, like every, I was like 15 years old every night, like do three hours of running every night. And um, I would just get those aches and pains even at 16. I was just kind of like, why am I getting knee pain? Why am I getting back pain? I didn't really feel like it was, you know, shouldn't really be having those sort of problems when you're that young and you're relatively fit. And then I kind of got into Pilates originally. And then through that, I've just got exposed to the biomechanics. So the Pilates teachers who were teaching me Pilates, all the um, like contrology stuff, they were just talking about biomechanics and like force vectors and levers and how those things worked. And I just kind of found that really interesting and how you could apply that to any movement. And it hasn't just got to be like the teaser in Pilates mm-hmm. or the hundreds. It could just be like you go for a run and look at how the femur head moves in the hip joint. And so I kind of got really into just doing more courses abroad. You were exposed to that at, at that age? Um, this, oh, yes. Yeah, so I probably jumped a few years. So I got into Pilates when I was probably about 17, okay. um, 18, 17. And then as I was doing the training, I just started to do my own kind of reading books about biomechanics and I guess more the intrinsic biomechanics. So yeah. it's obviously like you're looking at a squat and it's, you know, obviously you can see what's happening from the outside. And then it's kind of what's happening to the pelvis on the inside or what's happened to the femur on the inside. Um, and then I ended up over the years, like going to abroad, going to Paris and stuff and doing more training and just kind of s- s- somehow made a career out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't at all intentional. Yeah. It was yeah. just kind of out of more fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right way to do it, isn't it? Just yeah. To, I think so. Yeah. Just to follow your passion and let it go where you just let it go where it takes you. Um, just when you're holding that mic, just hold that a little bit lower on that. On that, that more there? Where your hand is holding on. Just there? grip it. Oh, okay, cool. Perfect. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm curious. Do you want to explain to everyone what the Franklin Method is? Yeah, so the Franklin Method, that's what I did in Paris uh, back a couple of years ago. And so what that basically is, um, it's an education and we teach people about it, it embodied function. So the idea is like, um, I guess our, our main tenant is, you know, so um, if you were to talk to someone about what, you know, what, what do you do most of the time? Do you, do you exercise more or do you move more in the rest of your life? And then normally most people will say, well, I move more in the rest of my life than I exercise. And then we're like, well, so what do you think will have a bigger impact on you physically? Exercise or the movement you do the rest of the time? And so someone could be, for example, I don't know, like doing all the best exercise in the gym or in the Pilates studio or yoga, you know, doing all the oysters and clam showers and squats and doing really good work for those hours that they're in the gym. But then if they're doing something for the rest of the time, that produces tension or produces... Like slouching. <laughs> yeah, like slouching. Yeah. Um, even just like the way you think. Like mm-hmm. that kind of thing, like producing like um, you know, like cortisol in the body. So we we look at basically um, uh, we basically look at evolution and neuroplasticity, and it's all about how can we kind of combine those two sciences uh, that's all, obviously I was evolving and actually make it really practical. So we took it, we look at biomechanics, we look at how the brain produces change. Um, our main thing is like uh, mental imagery or motor imagery. So there's loads of research now that you can actually uh, like engage muscles or even strengthen muscles just by thinking about them contracting. Mm. And we've there's kind of a few experiments loads. about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's loads. I've read one of them. I think it was the running one where mm. they got people to do nothing, then people to think about running, then people to actually run. And the physiological mm. differences between the thinkers and the mm-hmm. actual runners were like small. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's um, a piano one as well where they had yes. people learn how to play piano. Three groups. One group did nothing. Mm-hmm. The other group physically practiced and then the third group just practiced thinking about it with their brain without actually moving their fingers yeah. and obviously the practicing group was the best the one that physically but the other one showed a huge mm. improvement compared to the group that did absolutely nothing and on that study as well or that on that same study they found so that there was a five-day study and on the third day because they, they didn't study the, the piano one every day i think three times a day they would uh, do a brain map and see how the um how the fingers in the in the brain how it's, how it's been represent how it's been representative and basically found that on the third day they had the same brain changes in the fingers really, yeah. than the physical practice group. 
So just three days of like mental rehearsal yeah. and then that already had like a brain change, which is really cool. So, you mean in yeah. the homunculus? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So literally um, the part of the brain that represents the digits mm -hmm. um, was more, uh, I think it was bigger. It was, defined. More, it was more pronounced, more defined. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. I watched something a while ago and it was talking about Einstein's brain. Right. And they were dissecting, well, I think they dissected his brain and noticed that because he played the violin a lot, the, the part of his brain that did his hand movements and all of that and all of the music stuff had an extra groove um, and was a lot more like squished <laughs> is the best way I can describe right, cool. it, um, which was quite interesting. Mm. You, yeah. You just said a word and then you just agree, said it. Yeah. Like it was a nothing word. <laughs> you should know what it means. Do you want to just explain what the homunculus is? <laughs> well, I'll leave that to you, the bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, so basically what it, 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 what it is in a nutshell, it's a good thing to Google actually, because it's quite funny. It's basically, um, it's the um, it's the part of the brain that has like a representation for parts of the body. So, for example, actually, a, a perfect way to do this is if you get if you get three fingers out now mm -hmm. and you put three fingers on your cheekbone, yeah, you'll feel three fingers. Mm -hmm. And then if you get three fingers and put on your thigh, you're just going to feel push. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that. true. Yeah. So that's because there's there's a there's a better there's a greater representation or a richer representation of your face in your brain than there is your thigh, and so that's why you can have more of a sense of what's going on. For example, just the three fingers. And so for the homunculus idea is basically um, you have um, the whole body represented in the, in, in the brain. And for example, we know people in pain. Um, so it's kind of like, a, it's like an irony. So it's like, let's say you have back pain, for example, you might feel your back more because you're in pain. But then when we look at the, um, the brain map, it's at, the term is called smudging, whereas actually that part of the brain has become less, or that part, yeah, that part of the brain has become less um, cohesive. Yeah, I like to akin this to like Google Maps not being able to like have an area of a road that's yeah. like it hasn't been mapped at all. So it yeah. has no idea what's going on. So you get lost when you go there. Yeah. So it's a map essentially yeah, totally. of your body. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do in the Franklin Method is like um, we're trying to improve the proprioception. So that kind of mind body highway of communication. Because the idea is if you, um, the more we, we say the more information you have, the better you can like navigate your body. So the more information your nervous system has about like where my shoulder is, it can work out, okay, so I only need like this much tension in my upper traps and this much like, you know, activation in my rotator cuff. And then maybe if that communication's a little bit like um, distorted, you might have like an upregulation, like too much tonus in the shoulder. And so through like touching and like imagery and like trying to just even look at the shoulder girdle as a, as, a, as a structure, like why do you even have a shoulder girdle? Why not just have like an arm that meets the rib cage? And then actually look at, so what is the, what's the function of the collarbone? What's the function of a scapula? And then it's, it's almost like trying to educate people on like why you, have you even got this thing that you call body? And then how can that help in a really like practical way? How can you use that every day? So when you walk to your Pilates class or when you go to the gym, you know, your walk could be, um, could be encouraging better function and then when you go to the gym, then you're just going to reinforce that as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. So then why do we have a body? <laughs> mm. Oh, wow. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm not expecting you to be able to say this is, <laughs> this is why. Reason, but like, yeah, what kind of ideas get thrown around when you when you suggest that? Or what's the mm. what should people be thinking about on that one? Like, why would we have a body? I would say it's without getting into what the actual meaning of life is. It's mm. just... I know, I was, you're going down a yeah. very esoteric well, not, route. I mean, it's a vessel to what? To, to <laughs> survive. So one of my teachers, um, Eric Franklin, he says, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a sea squirt story. And this will answer your question, basically. Okay. The idea is like, it will go somewhere. <laughs> um, so the idea is basically, so if you have a sea squirt, it's like a some sort of like organism in the water. And it has like a really, really basic nervous system. And the whole purpose of the sea squirt's like life is to find a rock and then it will stay there forever. And then once it finds the rock, it will eat its own brain and it will just hang out there. And then the idea is hopefully food just passively comes by, you know, through the breeze and it will just kind of digest it. And so we always say like, you know, so you, you, um, you know, you don't need a brain if you don't need to move. That's the idea, right? So the okay. nervous system, like a lot of it is kind of there to help you get from A to B, so like survival. So I don't know, like I think a lot of it, humans are kind of interesting because we are like a, we're like, we're like really efficient, movers like I think they did a thing once with um with like a chimpanzee where they got a chimpanzee to walk like a mile on a treadmill at a certain pace and then they got a human to do the same thing and they found that humans are like four percent no four percent four times more efficient than how a chimpanzee would walk because of our like bipedal mm -hmm. gait basically and so I think a lot of having a body I guess from like a very like evolutionary yeah, like yeah. survival thing is kind of like from getting from getting to A to B as like as efficient as possible um and obviously you could probably go into more yeah 
like deeper things than that yeah no the same with that persistent hunting isn't it like you mm. want you've got an endurance capacity that uh, other animals don't have we can sweat and use our mouth at the same time which is like other animals our downfall is our brain yeah. i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> One thing I found really cool, actually, recently, you'd guys love, I was um, reading about why you have white in the eyes. Mm. You know, right? And it's like they reckon, so if you look at gorillas, um, gorillas uh, mostly have just pure black eye, but black in the eye with a bit of white. And they reckon, so primitive humans probably at some point had mostly black in the eye and then a little, little bit of white. And they reckon the reason why we evolved to have um, the whiteness around the eyes and then just a little uh, pupil is so you can tell where I'm looking. Yeah. So the idea is like, if I look at you, um, I can keep my head here, but I can look over there. Mm-hmm. Um, but so you can tell where my where my um, attention's going, basically. And oh, so you know, when you're talking to someone, that they might like try and maybe lie to you or something, and then they might look down, or that kind of thing. And so yeah. if you know where someone's looking, you can kind of get their intention. And so it's about more about communication. Oh. I thought that was quite cool. Yeah, that I, heard that's, cool. I heard very very similar as well. That it's also like a you can read how people react to different things by yeah by where their vision is, or if they're hunting and you don't want to make a noise, you can tell them with your eyesight. Because mm. for some reason. I can tell where you're looking. I can. I know what you're looking at when you look, even if you're looking in the mirror. Mm-hmm. So if you look at me in the mirror, if I look at you and you're looking in the mirror somewhere to your left, I can still. St- I still understand what the uh, what the reflection area is that you're looking at. But from why is that? How do we know where each other is looking? Mm-hmm. Because of this idea that yeah, it's a, it's a non-verbal communication thing that would keep the tribe and keep the community. Uh, accountable mm. well they reckon that's why people get uh, stage fright as well you know there's like loads of theories behind like stage fright um, or like um, being afraid to talk in front of public they reckon back in the day the only, the only time you ever would have been in front of a group of people is if the tribe were going to exile you and then you're like trying to convince them like don't let me like don't like don't exile me or don't kill me <laughs> and so it's like this real like you know high emotional situation and then mm-hmm. they reckon that's like a very much like an evolutionary thing so if you're on stage the reason why you might get like butterflies is because your brain's like are you going to be exiled <laughs> and then it's like trying to override yeah. that bit you know mm. and if I do a really bad job at the thing I'm about to do I'll <laughs> definitely be exiled yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're definitely going to kick me out um, so then going back to the neuroplasticity on the homunculus people are going to if they do google that they're going to they're going to see that shape you've seen it right I know, yeah, <laughs> I know what you're talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. so funny the yeah. big lips yeah, yeah. and huge hands yeah. Yeah. really mm. small thighs yeah yeah and just the rest of their body is almost non-existent and that's an idea that the brain can't map that space as accurately so you don't mm. have as much nerve endings or s- kind of sensations coming from that well i think it's also as well that your brain um takes up much more room to like Oh, how am I going to say this? For the things that we use the most. Did yeah. I say mm-hmm. that right? Yeah, yeah. So we use our hands so much. So it's represented by a large area of our brain because we use them so much. We need that dexterity mm-hmm. and that fine motor control. Yeah, um, totally. Well, if you were blind, like Braille, you'd have it even more pronounced. Yeah. But I reckon too, what, which I, what I really love, I think, about, I think about this all the time, is like um, so that the brain isn't big enough to store movement. If that, if that makes sense. So it doesn't. It, so it, the brain probably has like a very general idea of like certain movements that you do all the time, and that's like kind of like you know in, in the in the memory bank. But movement, like all the movements you would do all day long, even me just moving my, my arm to gesture, is there's just too much data. It would. It's just too sophisticated, and you, you can see that when people um, write their signature. You can never like write a signature exactly the same twice, mm. or even just doing that and then doing that again. It's not going to be like the exact same muscle fibers activating or the exact same. Um, like you know synapses turning on it would always be a bit different and so you're always kind of reinventing your motion which I think is quite cool mm. and um, it's kind of like the the good thing about systematic exercises obviously that you have a system but then also at the same time humans aren't systematic and so we're, we, there's also like an improvisational part of how people move which I think is always good to be aware of but I think they were like if you if you were to store movement in the brain your brain would be like three it'd have to be like three times bigger if you just saw all the movements. Yeah, every movement you could just possibly do. Yeah, yeah. If it was just like there so you could access it, it almost, so it's almost more automatic, if that makes sense. So how, how do you, I mean, yeah, I do know what you mean. That's very interesting because you would assume or, um, that like the better someone is at sports, the more their brain is able mm. to, like you were doing like a dart throw. Mm. Like, like well, I'll throw it and it'll be very different. Well, this is why our brain folds so that it has more... Mm-hmm. surface area yeah 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 yeah. Store, yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah instead of fitting like everything into a skull unfolded it like it squishes mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it's mm. my new word <laughs> squishes brain squish <laughs> very um, technical yeah so then okay so go back to the franklin method then that's the neuroplasticity side of things and then how does that because you're not we spoke briefly you're not the type of biomechanics 
biomechanist we stumbled over it again that looks after the calculations of the mathematical side it's much more movement based so mm. do you want to just differentiate that a little bit yeah totally yeah so i guess the best way to put it is so my, my two job spaces my first job is um, as a biomechanics coach so i teach for a company called biomechanics education and so what, what we basically do is we teach uh, like whether it's therapists or you know polite teachers or whatever uh, we teach them a system that assesses the whole body from head to toe so we're assessed like the feet, the, the, the sciatic nerve, the knees, the shoulders. And what we're trying to do is um, just based on research is, um, you know, is the area functioning as optimally as it could be? And obviously everyone's different. Everyone has different genetics. So that's, there's obviously going to be room for um, uh, different genetic expression as far as like what we sh should expect from someone. Um, but the idea of that is we're always trying to work out, can we, um, can we try and prevent the risk of injury? So if someone, for example, like if they have like a really tight sciatic nerve um, and then that's maybe inhibiting their hamstrings ability to contract, depending on what sport they're doing, like if they're like a ballet dancer, for example, that could potentially be like a hamstring strain waiting to happen. Um, it may not as well. So there's always that kind of room for that. So that's one thing we do there. We're trying to look at the biomechanics of a person basically um, and then see if we can help just help, basically help them function better and move more efficiently. And then with the Franklin method, it's not so much about assessing, it's more like an education of like um, showing like, you know, what is the body, like why have you got a foot, like why have you got a navicular, um, like going almost quite detailed and talking about, you know, how did it evolve or how do we think it evolved anyway, and then how can we actually improve the function of like, the ankle joint through like touching the area, like imaging, like the talus moving underneath the tibia when you walk, um, and just trying to see if we can actually update the, uh, the, uh, the feedback uh, from the nervous system to, to the body. So it's very much, a, it's almost quite, quite a somatics type practice, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it's nice because they're, they're almost on two different ends of the spectrum, which I quite like. So it's very kind of like systematic on one end and yeah. assessments and biomechanics and then a bit more kind of mind, body, somatics, but still mm. grounded in science and, yeah. and, and still progressing with obviously the times and when new research comes out. So we had a research study come out recently from my friend Amit in America. Um, who's a physical therapist and it was all about um, tr uh, trying to see if we can improve uh, people with Parkinson's their body schema of their pelvis which tends to be a little bit distorted which can inhibit their motion so going back to the homologous so you said the body mm -hmm. is schema what did you say body schema so what that, what that basically is is it's the um the, again the representation of the body part in, sure. the, in the nerve system so what we found is is uh, people with Parkinson's tend to have a um, the, the uh, I guess what's the right term the homunculus area that would represent the hip joints, for example, might not be as clear as someone without Parkinson's. And so what we found is if they had a um, a, a better understanding in their mind of actually w where are the hip joints located, um, how does the femur move in the acetabulum, and even some of the muscles that might even drive that movement and then get them to actually imagine doing it as they go for a walk or as they bend their legs. Um, we found that over time that actually improved their motion. Um, so that was really So how cool. would you deliver that info to the brain? So again, we would do it through like, for example, just finding um, where are the hip joints? So we showed them with the pelvis, like, so here's a pelvis. Keep that nice and close. So Sorry. visually, visually. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. one would be visually, so it'd be like actually having a pelvis, find, showing the femur heads and actually showing, so this is where we connect and then getting them to actually touch where their femur heads meet their hip joints too, and then like folding from there and then even showing them. So like uh, if this is like the, if the microphone's the femur head and that's the acetabulum, like showing it rolling in the hip joint and then getting them to like almost feed it back to themselves right. as they're doing a movement. Mm. So basically you're teaching people to understand the anatomy of their body to better able them to move it yeah totally through visual and sensory stimulation yeah. of those areas yeah t exactly yeah and if you're like a, a bit of a nerd like me or you guys then we can go into detail on like you know the the labrum around the area or mm. the actual like the, the acetabulum is more like a cup than it is more like an actual circle and actually going into nitty-gritty stuff that's really cool um or you can keep it really basic yeah like for people who aren't like that like just find the hip joints can you move from there and not move as much from your back i think a lot of people are into it once you once you can explain yeah. the cup the cup yeah. the and, and the mm. like they may not remember the like two days later but yeah they mm. get you they're with you and you can see yeah. cogs turning and people really appreciate it. and mm. i always find it's better to for them it's better to try be the over explainer yeah to see if once you understand it they get it you can see and then somebody asks you a very intuitive, a very spot on question. You're like, yes, okay, you're mm. getting it. You're with me. Um, you're doing that with people with Parkinson's. So that must be, a, that's a difficult challenge. Like that must be a, a simple win then to take that same 
technique with somebody who's maybe suffering with pain or someone who's just super mm-hmm. stiff and tight. Mm-hmm. Those same strategies, not necessarily with the extreme and the, mm-hmm. like the Parkinson's, but that was work wonders then with visual. What did you say it was? So it's mainly like as you were saying. So it's like mm. visual, uh, kinesthetic, um, auditory. So, for example, imagery, you can have uh, metaphorical imagery. So it's like that would be, for example, borrowing the quality of something that you already have in your nerve system and then literally borrowing it and then putting it in your body and seeing if you like it. So a good example for that would be, it sounds kind of cheesy, but let's say like you imagine like your shoulders melting like ice cream. And then if your nerve system has like a kinesthetic memory of like, oh, I know what ice cream feels like when it melts or like, you know, even like melting wax, that kind of thing. Obviously, your shoulder isn't an ice cream or your shoulder isn't wax. Yeah. But you can borrow that kinesthetic idea and see if it does anything for the body. And it's like whether whether it releases more tension or improves movement or we do more like more biomechanical anatomical imagery. So on so that we, one, are, yeah. you, are you telling me there's credible there's credibility to the yoga instructors telling you to melt into your mat mm. there is is there there well, is well ground down into yeah, the there earth. is <laughs> melt into your well mat. it's yeah. it's imagery for sure you're getting people to yeah. to imagine things like i used to with yoga have this i a skill that i don't possess as easily anymore but be able to imagine things and see things in my mind and then my body would just do them like poses that i've never done before or things that were quite challenging i would see it and then imagine it in my mind so my own body would do it and then yeah go bing Mm. up and yeah it's like it's just given the nervous system input isn't it so like whether it's an anatom so i guess for example like the advantage of like using anatomy as a cue or anatomy as a um as an image is well it's kind of you know everyone can relate to that to some level everyone has a hip joint everyone has like Mm. an asis and you can normally touch those areas that's like a really good um starting point and then the real advantage to like kinesthetic oh no sorry metaphorical imagery is it can be really personal so you can actually get like a real like you can almost get the nervous system really engaged then so we always say for example um, everyone has that memory when you're a kid of like you know maybe you asked that girl out and she said no and it's like oh or like, you know, you have to like... When talk. I was a kid, that still happens. <laughs> it still happens now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just hope you less. Yeah. But all like, for example, you know, when you're like um, in the classroom and you've got to like talk in front of your friends and it's like, you, you know, you get nervous. Mm. Everyone has that memory of like that kind of thing. And the reason why we remember those um, events is because they're very emotionally uh, driven. There's like, a, there's like a real high emotion behind it. And so what we try and do is if someone improves like a part of their body, like less tension in the shoulders or their back feels better from back pain, we try and get them to a notice, notice a change because the brain only ever really notices change. Everything else is as autopilot. And then B is like, so have you got any images or any any associations that you can tie to that feeling and, and, and make it quite detailed so you can actually keep it as more of a long-term positive change? So rather than being like, oh, I feel better. Okay, bye. It's kind of like, well, how does that feel then? Oh, it feels more relaxed or it feels like I feel more comfortable and... It, it, you know, it, they've even got to say it verbally, but even just in their, in their minds, like how can I, how can I make this experience last longer? In the yeah, brain? yeah. Mm. How can you amplify it just for yeah. to make it penetrate more? And yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, all these tactics are really useful. I know the sensory stimulation I used a lot on my right foot after my accident. It always felt like after not moving or standing or walking for like a huge chunk of time, it was maybe like six or seven months, my right foot always felt like a club, like Mm. I couldn't identify my toes anymore. And I used to rub it with like all of this different, um, different materials. So things that were really coarse, like a brush, a toothbrush, then things that were really soft. And over time, like I felt like I started to get to feel what my foot felt like again, still not all there, but, um, even when you, um, sometimes I do it along the lines of my scars. So there's a lot of the, the times, the areas, like when you have surgery, it, the whole area goes numb. So I have whole sections of my foot and hip that are really, really numb. So I used to like toothbrush them all the time or like get a ball and roll cool. around. And it definitely helps... Yeah, it helps to kind of bring awareness back to that area. And over time, you definitely feel like you regain some of that sensory um, ability to differentiate touch and, and movement. Well, it's funny with rehab too. There was a study done. I can't remember who did it now, but it was, it was actually like 2010. But they did a study where um, they had a, a guy, imagine uh, five kilos, like a dumbbell in his hand. And they had all these receptors like t- up to the... Um, up to the muscles that flex the elbow and they wanted to find out if, if, it, if him imagining doing like a bicep curl with five kilos would that actually engage any of the muscles that would become active if he were to do it, actually do it physically 
And they found that when he actually imagined it enough times, there was a bit of activation in those muscles. But then the cool bit is then they said, okay, that's cool. Let's now imagine 10 kilos. So he's, again, he's holding nothing. He mm-hmm. did 10 kilos and got more activation. Oh, really, yeah. And so what, what was cool about that is they were just saying in that study, like they were suggesting that even like perceived effort can be, obviously like something is 10 kilos, it's 10 kilos. But if your perceived effort is like, well, it's 20 kilos or it's as heavy than what it is, or I don't want to exercise today or that kind of thing. Those, all those things have real kinesthetic, I guess almost consequences to yeah. how you move. Mm. Um, especially with rehab where things don't always, like let's say you damage a ligament or whatever, um, the mechanoreceptors or the proprioceptors don't always grow back as intelligent. Mm. I think it's maybe not the right word, but they're not. Uh, there's not. They're not normally as richly innovated. Yeah, as I always the original feel product. like it's instead of like when you hold someone's hand, you hold it really tightly. I feel like it's just held really loosely, so it's not as strong. The connection is not as mm. strong. That's how I would describe it from just a personal perspective. What mm-hmm. I felt, um, I experienced. Uh, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, Is that yeah, what yeah. you're describing? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I guess like one thing we do a lot, um, and it's, uh, you know, other people do it too, but I guess one thing we're trying to do in the Franklin Method is like, it's almost trying to not do anything new. So for example, humans, you know, you're going you're gonna to think whether you, you know, want to or not. You're going to have thoughts in your head, about 90,000 a day. You're going to have images in your head that you can associate with certain thoughts or feelings. And so if you're already using this tool, why not use it better if you're not, if you maybe weren't using that great before, to help facilitate, you know, better posture or better movement or anything that you mm-hmm. want to, you know, it kind of feel in your body, basically. And so, um, yeah, it's really fun because it's kind of, it's always kind of, tra- obviously, as you know, those those areas are always changing and growing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Well, data. you can. These things are also represented when you look at people's posture. And as soon as you change your own posture, like your shoulders are back, you sit really tall, you look up, you feel instantly better mm-hmm. as opposed to when you slouch and you like concave your spine and you look down instantly that changes your mood and your thoughts and yeah. mm. and I guess the thing with that as well is like um it's a funny one because I think so you know with posture it's always it's always, it's, 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 it, uh, that's a really interesting topic because there's technically no such thing as bad posture because the idea like I would, I would agree with you like you know if you're here all day that's not optimal probably for your mind and also like breathing and loads of things but at the same time like um posture is like a balancing act isn't it like you know there's always a bit of movement that we do one thing with our students where we um, get them into a room and we tell them to close their eyes and uh, try to not move a muscle, like just try and be totally static, like a, like a statue. And then what they what they find is, is um, there's always this constant sway, like you're always kind of just oscillating around your axis. And so there's you can't ever be like static, like a building, for example. Yeah. And so... Um, Especially if you close your eyes. Yeah, right. You can mm. really, you've ever done that? You, re, you yeah. really feel yeah. it, right? Yeah. And you either go you sideways start, you or you go slightly forwards or backwards. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you can go, go to sideways. the point where it gets, it goes <laughs> like, you can really feel like, I might have to take a step here and keep mm. my balance. Mm. And so I guess like, um, you know, I think there's one thing, is one of the guys I follow, what's his name? His name's losing me now, but he's a, he's a pain science expert. And what they're finding is there's no research that links posture to pain, which is really interesting. Is it Lauren Mosley, one of those guys? Or it's not him, it's the other one. He's got curly hair and he's Australian. They're always Australian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, a lot of these pain guys are Australian. <laughs> yeah. um, it'll come to me in a minute, but he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a lower back expert, lower back pain expert. But they were saying, um, you know, so obviously like pain, for example, is like a multifactual thing, right? So pain could be biomechanical, it could be emotional, it could be nutritional, it could be, you know... Psychological, I think so many things, yeah. in Explain Pain, they, mm. they discuss a lot about... They discuss just, the humunculus as well. Yeah, they? and just understanding pain mm. gives you a totally different perspective on mm. it entirely. Mm. Makes you less likely to experience mm. yeah. prolonged chronic pain. And, and less anxious when you do feel it mm. because you understand okay mm. i haven't just shredded my spine apart here i've just been sitting so let me ask you this because you touched on one thing there when you were saying about the movement um people who are sitting at a, at a desk all day this is a quite a common thing and i'd love to hear your thoughts on it people are sitting at a desk all day typing away they sit down at 2 p.m no back pain they've not moved they've not put a whole load of weight on their back they're not grinding their spine apart why would that back start to feel a little bit twitchy and a little bit achy? Like, is that's part of that same sensory mechanism. I have my own bro science theory on mm-hmm. it. Um, and I'm going back to the, the, that kind of humunculus, that no susceptive signaling, that the brain's not receiving anything there because there's no movement. So mm-hmm. the brain's not understood. There's no info being, being sent to it from the small little bits around the joints and whatever else. So it's starting to, to ring its own alarm bell and it's creating that pain. 
how far off is that? That's pure bro science from my own. I made that up. Yeah, I think you. I think I think it's a lot of things. I think that's definitely one of them. I think it's hard to always know. Like, oh, it's this more than that. But I think that's yeah. definitely a massive thing. I think. Um, I think, for example, like the brain. I guess, like you know, organisms are always trying to do two things, aren't they? They're always trying to uh, save time and conserve energy. And so, if the nervous system is like, okay, so Keith isn't really using these muscles very much because he's always in this position, like flex, whatever. Let's say, like motivitus. You know, why are we wasting energy producing all these muscle fibers when we could just put more collagen there and just be done with it? Because collagen, we haven't got to, we haven't got to worry about ATP. It's passive, so let's just put more there. And then that's fine if you were a chair, because then you'd just be a chair. But then obviously, if you want to then move, then go for a run, then that that might be a conflicting thing. So I think that's definitely one thing is is that proprioceptive element. I think another thing is like um, like joints need three things daily to be healthy, and that would be like compression and then decompression and then movement at their fullest range. So okay. not, not, not necessarily stretching, although I'm a really big advocate for stretching, but the idea is like, so if you could argue that if a joint is lacking those three things, maybe not in a day, but like let's say a couple of years, yeah. then that could also be a factor with the facet joints, for example. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Um, and I think too, I, I guess it kind of combines the, the other two is like um, what, you, what you said about movement. So there, there was a research paper did done where they had people sit like this, and they had like receptors around the, the torso and the spine. So th they did this and they so found- So for the people listening, you're, you're sort of just sitting forward, feet, mm, feet sorry. together. Yeah, so I'm slouching. Audio people. Yeah, yeah. So I'm slouching forward um, and they, ra they found that after a few minutes, if you slouch forward too long, you um, overload the spinal ligaments um, at the back and the muscles. Um, and then if you were to like almost sit, sit upright, but then they go too far back. So now I'm like in extension of my back. Also the front would be overloaded. And they found that, so that those aren't necessarily optimal positions. And if I have quote unquote good posture, so I'm just like, you know, evenly stacked up. If I'm here for too long, everything is overloaded. How? Because now there's just too much pressure. Okay. So the idea is that we could say old school biomechanics would be, you have your, you have your vertebra and you want to have like 80% on the vertebral bodies and then you want to have 10% on the facet joints. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like old school biomechanics. But then we know through like the postural sway that that's never a thing anyway. That's yeah. you're always oscillating. But you probably could get that if I was to stay here all day. But now there's too much compression, okay, and there's not enough decompression, oh, yeah. and so the idea is like th your best that you need to move. Hundred percent, you need to share yeah. the weight around. Yeah, so yeah. basically, it's like uh, my my mentors, Eric says, your, your your best posture is your next posture. So, for example, we used to always demonize like you shouldn't cross your legs over because it might twist your pelvis. But then we're like, well, actually, it probably won't do that. And then it's but what, what, what might be good is to cross your leg for like a few minutes, mm -hmm. then come here again, then yeah. maybe cross the other leg over, and getting that blood flow, different muscles, stimulating the mechanoreceptors that like you were saying before, like that proprioception. And then also the, so the joints get those three things they want every day, which is the movement, compression, and decompression. So that, there probably is more fat than that, but I think that's a big one. Yeah, no, I, I really understand. That's really good. A really interesting way of looking at it. Um, you spoke earlier about myth busting. Mm. Part of what you do in some of your talks, you just sit down and you just bash out ideas. And what are some of the main ones that you can rattle off or run through? My favorite one at the moment um, is actually with the knees. So, um, so one, one thing we do a lot, I've got some friends in Birmingham um, in movement therapy and we do a lot of rehab. And obviously, what we're trying to do is if someone's injured, then we're trying to make sure we try and rehabilitate them and just try and build up their tissue tolerance so they don't get re injured. And so one thing we found, uh, and these guys told me about this, and then I, I tried it in my own clinic, is let's say, for example, someone's got like a knee injury. So let's say their medial uh, collateral ligament is injured. And, you know, they would go through the rehab. So, you know, you know, you do like, you know, your strength program. So you're squatting, for example. And let's have like the, uh, what is it, the, the, uh, the knee going over the second toe. So you want to have like, quote unquote, good technique. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say you get to that person to a point, let's say after a couple of months, where they're asymptomatic. So there's no pain and they're getting stronger and they're getting like better movements, their functions back. Let's say they're like a rugby player or a runner or a soccer player. Um, they're inevitably going to go into knee valgus. doesn't matter how good your biomechanics is, it's just, just the way it is. So if someone's going to go into knee valgus, why don't we train them to have tolerance in knee valgus? And knee valgus is when kind of the knee falls in yeah. and mm -hmm. the inside joint is almost stretched. So you're like, yeah. a, like a knock knee position. Knock knees, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the idea basically is like, so knee valgus is basically, you could say it's too much movement in the coronal plane, so that'd be like the frontal plane, going into the midline, so your knee's falling in. So what we found was, is um, what, what these guys found was, and they told me about this, was basically 
you know, okay, great, let, let's get them back to like, you know, a certain baseline so they're strong in like a more traditional sense, like good technique. Then let's take all the weight off the, the rack. Let's put like five kilos on maybe, like start there, get them to do squats and actually coach them to produce knee valgus. Okay. And the purpose behind that is, well, you're going to go into it. So let's train. You only really get strong in the areas you train. So let's sure. train you to be conditioned in an area where you were forward deconditioned. And so we're not saying that every time you take a step, you should be going into knee valgus yeah. or knee varus. We're not saying that. But I guess what we're trying to say is, well, what, one thing I like is um, there's no such, in, no movement is inherently good or bad. It's just like, you know, every, you know, and it's good to have variety, right? Like it's good to do the downward dog wrong sometimes. Yeah. Like just to have that variety. Um, and especially when it comes to sports people, you actually want to train them to be tolerant in all planes of motion and ranges of motion if, if that's what their sport they're going to be in, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely one. So you said there's no movement that's inherently mm. wrong. So what, what would you have to consider that is wrong? Because I'm, I'm on the same line of thought you and I would just simply add to that. There's just load. Mm -hmm. There's just load and speed that can... Because we did a movement yesterday in the gym, Jefferson Curl. Yep, that's great. Yeah, really poor. And I'm, I'm telling people, as, give me the worst posture you can possibly give me. It's not for everybody, so don't go just yeah, yeah. It and jamming it in Maybe your Maybe you program. can explain to everybody so what it is. Stand, you stand up straight, and then almost like you're rolling yourself down like a, like, a, like a carpet rolling up. You go chin on your chest, and you just go slow out your shoulders, and you're going really bad posture, curving yourself, but you're doing it segmentally from top down, 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 down. You reach the bottom, you're, you're kind of stretching out towards your toes, and then as you come back up, you're imagining one Lego block coming back in place at a time, and you come all the way up to a, to a straight neck. That, I, I think that's one of the best exercises when, when it's done properly, but you can't put 20 kilos in someone's hand for that because the s small muscles, not the big muscles, blah, blah, blah. But again, that's not then to train for that bad posture in a deadlift. You know, it doesn't, car it doesn't jump to that kind mm -hmm. of correlation. But there's, and I agree with you, there's no movement because if your body can move that way, we should try and move that way and we should try and get it to condition into well, that kind I of Well, I think movement. that also akins to when you see, say, people with um, disc issues and the main thing that you hear is, oh, no loaded spinal flexion. And it's like, but they're going to go into spinal mm. flexion irrespective. Like they're going to pick up their groceries from the floor or yeah. their kids or they're going to twist or do other things. So I agree with you in that regard that, yeah, why not actually get people to move in the way that they're going to move in their mm. daily life? Yeah. And I think the thing is too, like it's, it's um, like, like, you're, like you're both saying, and I think it, it, it can never be said enough. Actually, is is the nuance behind it? So like, w like we can say, for example, like Jefferson Curl. Like, yeah, you should do it and roll down. Like, and like you said, like for example, obviously not everyone do it straight away because someone who is symptomatic or has a clinical issue in their back, maybe this may not be the first thing they should be doing. Yeah. And then then that needs to be they need to be with a professional and they need to find out. Okay, so w what are the phases I need to actually train through before it would actually be appropriate or I even necessary to mm -hmm. do like a Jefferson curl? And so that's where I think before where you know, and I, I come from the world of like aesthetics, the idea like Pilates and dance. You know, it's ha it's how the movement looks, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But then it's like, you know, we can get stuck on like, well, okay, you might like it to look that way. But it doesn't mean that if I do it the other way, that's inherently ill health or bad. It just means it's a different way of doing it. But I think sometimes, especially in like the Pilates world, we can they, they can get very caught up in like um, like this is the right way to do this exercise, mm, the methodology and yeah. the breathing and how yeah. and yeah. Well, like a massive one is um another one's great is like the idea of um like femoral antiversion and retroversion. You know, like so for example, some people you know Charlie Chaplin like the the, the heels in and the, the toes out. That, that kind of thing. So like some people will, will stand like that and it might be because they have tight glutes and that's fine and whatever. Or they might stand like that because the angle from the femoral neck to the shaft mm -hmm. is more, like just through genetics is more back. It's slightly twisted. Yeah. More twisted. And, yeah. and actually them doing that position, that more like Charlie Chaplin position, that has better bone to bone contact for the femur head and the acetabulum. And so that's more stable for them. Yeah. And so if they were to do like a heavy squat, they should probably be more like that than necessarily really parallel. But again, it, that is, it's quite nuanced because yeah. it's like, well, what's a good squat then? Yeah. And it's like, well, it depends on the person. Yeah. And that's such a, I, I, when people ask those questions, I, ha I hate when I have to say it depends. Because it, it sounds sa like they know It anything. sounds <laughs> like, oh, well, it depends. And yeah. it's just, yeah. well, how do I migrate this? But no, I, you're completely correct. Like this, uh, and I don't know where this fall comes from. It's sort of like, how do you, how do you train enough people who want to be fitness instructors in as short a time as possible? 
at the lowest level of the class and then get them out into the world where they're safe. I think we've discussed this before, like about teaching people the foundation first yeah. and the rules and then teaching them to be yeah. open-minded and, and understanding the research as opposed to teaching them big spectrum stuff and then people getting get confused, yeah. so confused. Yeah, we had the show with anatomy as well. Like we had a guy talking about that, a fantastic guy, he knows his fa- fascial trains upside down. Cool. And we were discussing like, where do you where do you start people on their anatomy course? Mm-hmm. Do you just go simply, this is the thing and that's the other thing and this goes from that thing to that thing? Or do you think, talk about kinetic chains and, mm-hmm. and like movements and spiral lines and everything like that? Like it's, where do you begin? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's another one though. You could you probably just, you, the knees over toes. Because mm-hmm. I'm almost a, like an officer of all ranks. I started b- back in the day as an I course fitness instruction and I learned that and then I did in more courses, more there and then eventually we got enough to get into a degree and then I went through that university level. But I remember knees behind your toes on a lunge. Like mm-hmm. one of my like the lunge for me is one of the is, is my ultimate exercise. People go, What's if you could have one exercise for the rest of your life, I'll do a lunge because mm-hmm. you can do everything mm-hmm. I can almost do everything with a lunge mm-hmm. from the lower limb. I can hit T- ligaments and heat and whatever but i'm training people sometimes lift your heel up we're going to lunge on your toes only you're going to and now you're going to rotate and you're going to let that knee go all the way forward i want more weight forward i want mm-hmm. you like nearly falling over and people are looking at me like why I'm like this is why so i mean what else on, on the myth buster trail yeah i was just about to ask that yeah, <laughs> yeah. um i guess like and it's it feels weird that this is still a myth buster is actually the core thing that, that's interesting because um because I, I, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Like you, you, you hang out in your circles, and you, you have this assumption that everyone thinks the way you think, or at least, let's say, for example, like there's some new research comes out, and then all of your buddies know about it, and then you just assume that that's like, oh yeah, like that's like the new baseline now. Like we're going to go forward with this knowledge, and so it's always really interesting. Even like, um, like I go to, like, I sometimes teach at some uh, like ballet schools, like really like high up ones in London, and they're still teaching like these really, like, and they're phenomenal teachers, by the way. I'm not saying they're like not good teachers, but they're teaching like, for example. Um, you know, you have to keep your navel into your spine. So you draw your navel into your spine. And then from there, now you move flu- like, with, with freedom. <laughs> and it's funny because it's like, so I guess the reason why that's a myth buster is because, so let's say the navel to the spine thing, well, that actually would upregulate some muscles. So the tone is sort of like more tibidi and or more tibidus and TA would upregulate. So they become more on. But then the internal and external obliques actually downregulate. And so you're actually less stable because if you've got a bunch of muscles around the spine, and obviously their jobs are to, to move the spine, relay information to the brain, and also keep a certain rigidity in the joints, if now some of those muscles aren't even actually activating that much, you've technically got less stability. And then on the, on the other end of the spectrum, let's say bracing, so that's like you just turn everything on. So bracing is like that, everyone braces whenever you cough, whenever you do number two, that kind of thing, you brace the core. So that's just turning everything on, which is good. But then the problem with that is like, so let's say, for example, we do this thing a lot in the class where I'll get everyone just to stand up and put their like, index finger into their torso, into their stomach, and just, just feel the tonus as natural. And then if you were to do like a jump or to like just move your torso really quickly, it's automatic. The, um, there's an upregulation in the muscle tissue. But the thing that has to be maintained the whole time is it has to be dynamic. So if you tell someone, draw your navel to your spine, or brace, and then we're going to do these series of movements. Well, depending on what movement you do, you're going to need a certain rig- amount of rigidity in the system and a certain amount of, a certain amount of mobility, mm-hmm. and that has to be adaptive. And it took, and it's funny because it, it took evolution billions of years to work this one out. You know, it's it's amazing. Like you know, the the brain was like, we've got these, we've got a big problem here. We've got to be able to move, like A to B, like we were saying before. We've got to move. We've got to stay stable, but also we have to breathe. So the muscles that move your torso, like for example, when you walk, you rotate, so the muscles that move your torso, they also have to produce a level of rigidity in the system to keep you stable. And then also a lot of those muscles also are accessory breathing muscles. And we know now the diaphragm is also a core muscle. It also stabilizes, it becomes more rigid when you move. And so all those muscles, it's so intelligent. They have to do all three, mo- three jobs, which are almost a bit counter, they're, b- they're a bit conflicting, but it's able to do that without you having to think about it. And so if we always say, if you have to think about it, you haven't got it, Right. if that makes sense. If yeah. you have to so feel it turn on, then it's on, it's on too much. Are you, are you saying then that potentially maybe the cueing could progress into just being instinctual and people moving the way that they move? Right? Yeah, and I think, again, like go back to what we were saying before, it depends on the person. So let, let's say there are some, de- def- definitely are very rare situations, like clinically, where let's say, for example, someone post-childbirth, 
And let's say, for example, they had like a they had they have a great time with the childbirth, and so their pelvic floor, for example, proprioceptively, it's not maybe engaged as well as it could be. So then maybe doing those kind of kegel exercises could be a good way to get that proprioception back. But then it shouldn't be the end outcome. Like you're always in the kegel like the mm-hmm. rest of your life, or you're always drawing in your name. What's the what's the kegel? It's, it's, you know what I'm. It's the well, how would you describe the kegel? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a pelvic floor <laughs> exercise. Pelvic, yeah. I think you can also they you can describe it as like try not to fart. Basically, that's what you do. Okay. Yeah, or <laughs> like the sphincters yeah. down there. You're engaging yeah. them. Okay. <laughs> it's your pubic. It's, it, all the muscles do it, but the main it's your it's, it's your pubic rectalis. It's a muscle that basically loops around your anus, goes from the pubic bone, goes around the anus. Yeah, and it literally when you engage it, it just closes up the anus. Right, and so that and that's what basically what the kegel is. So you're just you're just engaging that muscle. And so what I was glad I asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you know so that'll be your next PT session. Yeah. We're going to do the, the kegel. <laughs> But um, so I guess like, you know, everything ha- like we were saying before, like everything has its place. So there definitely are. I'm not saying there's not a situation in, in the world where you wouldn't have to do navel to spine. But it probably is a very specific one on one clinical scenario mm-hmm. when someone's recovering from an injury or something like that. It's, it wouldn't be like a thing you would give to like just the general public. And there's like 20 people in a room. Yeah. So I guess like um, I guess the main myth thing with that is almost like. Your body's so bloomin' smart, and it's it's taken billions of years. For, like you're you're like the what's the latest iPhone right now? Is it iPhone seven? Mm. Just do ten. ten. iPhone X, ten. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're like the iPhone ten of like humanity at the moment. Like you're kind of the most. We're updated. an X. Yeah. <laughs> or an X, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Like whatever the. But you know what I mean. And so it's like letting your nervous system work out how much tonus you need at the appropriate time. I think is more beneficial, more realistic to how the body is designed. Yeah. More than thinking like you never see like a any you never see like an animal like a gazelle before it runs like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Just, yeah. It just, yeah. just moves. That's the supple it leopard yeah. idea, yeah. isn't it? With the Kelly Starlet one. Yeah. Like right. The the leopard doesn't have to warm up and stretch before it goes hunting. Mm. It just wakes up and goes. Yeah. So why are humans so rubbish at, at getting up and going? <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's also this assumption that we're, un- we're it's this assumption we're not stable, which is weird. Like the, the, the core thing, it's like, well, I need to strengthen my spine and my spine's not stable. And it's like, it's kind of funny because it's like, well, how do you assess for an unstable spine? Like, there's, I, don't, I wouldn't know of anyone, any assessments for that. Like, actually, how do you assess? For yeah. example, like human touch isn't, isn't um, our, so our somat- somatosensory cortex, part of the brain that basically is more kinesthetic, it's not advanced enough for us to better palpate and feel like one millimeter of movement in the sacroiliac joint sure, or, yeah, yeah. or like a few degrees of movement in like the lumbar vertebra. But then people might claim that they can feel that. Yeah. And it's fine if they, f- if they think that, but then it's, I think we should just always be aware that that's not based in science, or at least not currently. Yeah. And so when someone says, oh, L5 is, you know, unstable, it's like... Yeah, is it really? Is it really? And how are you getting to that? Because, I mean, I try and tell people, tell people all the time, like, when you're, when you're walking around the shops and you feel back pain, you're not grinding down on your, on your disc. Like, you're not mm. suddenly just flicked a corner off and now there's a disc bulge. Like, there's, mm. there's this whole other thing that you don't necessarily aren't aware of called your nervous system. It's not always structural, mechanical, like, um, the building blocks aren't fading away. Mm. Is that kind of st- yeah the same with the with the instability? You ha- you'd like there was a I posted a thing on the um, on my Instagram and it's a complete joke. It's 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 one of those. Is this that silly video yeah, that you made so me watch? I, I don't understand this joke, but I want we'll to show watch you it. after. It's basically there's some there's some TV show like from Mexico or South America where there's a guy speaking Spanish or Portuguese to the presenter, and whatever the story is, they're in hysterics laughing. Okay, so now what people have done is they've taken that as a whole meme video and they're putting in subtitles. Completely. Right. Oh, un- I think I've seen this. Completely unrelated I've to whatever this, he's talking yeah. about. And one of the jokes <laughs> is that this physio yeah. says that if he moves my tibia, he's going to fix my pelvis. Right. And he's like, oh, oh, he looks at me, he gets on the bed, my pelvis is out of line, they start laughing. He goes, he rubs my tibia, he pushes my tibia back and forth, then he stands But he's not up. saying that whatsoever. Yeah, he's not saying that. He's yeah, telling yeah. some yeah. joke. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, telling yeah. Some, some, some joke in Spanish, <laughs> some story in Spanish. Um, and he's like, but his point is, these guys think that if we were that delicate, we'd all be falling over and we'd all just be collapsing. And it's, it's exactly true. Like, if we're not, like, I don't know how to explain it more than that. It, I thought that was so funny, that mm. video. Caroline didn't think so. Yeah, do you know why? It's because I speak Spanish. So I was oh, cool. listening to right. it <laughs> and going, what are, you, what are you making me watch? Yeah. So I was listening to what he was saying and then reading it and going, like, this is stupid. Mm. 
Oh, it's a really funny video, isn't yeah. it? There's the, the same video. It's exactly that, and it's um, it's about this. Uh, the, what, does it, what does he say? The, the physio thought that he could palpate my psoas yeah, I've major. S- I've seen that. And one it's well. it's really funny, like because he just like he cracks up, doesn't it? The yeah, whole time. It's so that's good. exactly the same video. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I think it's because so, it's just a laugh. It's just mm. infectious. But his point is just like if we were that st- unstable. Mm. If you can move your tibia and you're going to move my pelvis, then we're going to fall over yeah. every time we turn mm. around. There's a really good, I, I can't remember who did it, but it was on Instagram. You, you'd like this, actually. You both would like it. It was um, it was a picture of, um, you know, like, you, like your dad ever have like a, like a tool kit, like a toolbox in the shed or something. And then there's always that one, re- like it's like normally the the um, the actual, uh, the handle is like wooden, like big thick wood. And then there's a massive chunk of metal when it's like a hammer. Like a really like just a like, rusty old mm. hammer and he's like if you look at those toolkit boxes like all the finely tuned bits of equipment they always and, and inevitably break but that rusty old yeah. hammer just never breaks yeah. and it always is reliable and they were saying when it comes to like rehab it's like if, if you're injured like obviously there are things we could maybe finally tune it a bit more but it, it actually should be more about let's, in, let's, in, let's increase your tolerance to loads and forces and get you to absorb mm. force better let's make you almost more like that, that hammer that's really robust and yeah. won't break, rather than focusing maybe on like, you know, these little tweaks here that are probably quite subjective. Yeah. And I don't know, like if it, if it, has, any, if it has any long-term benefit. Mm. Good, yeah. Like the little nuances. Yeah, because they do that a lot in Pilates, talk about all of the tiny, tiny little things. And it's like, really, we're gonna spend 20 minutes talking about this? Like, let's move, just yeah. move. It's, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think sometimes people can get really stuck in the methodology as opposed to just going, look, it's going to be in any everyone's benefit to move and move as best we can in mm. as many directions and planes as we can. And also people like, and, and that's what I like about what we do is um, it's, to me, it's more of an art than a, it is a massive science, but to me, it's more of an art because I've, You've, I've, I know you guys have done, have met people like this. Too. Like, there's I've people who um, who are like amazing dancers or amazing um, martial artists, and they they don't necessarily move like well. But they don't get injured, and they're like the, the, the top of their game. Like when you saying Bolt's always a good example of that. Like they kind of talk about his mechanics and his feet, and how like you know he shouldn't really be able to run as fast as he could do, but he's doing it. And you know, I just find that really interesting too. How there's always these outliers. Mm. Yeah. You know, like the basketball players that you see that are tiny. Yeah. 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 Totally right. And like, um, yeah. And I, I just think that's always a good thing too. I think it's always really good because it's, it's that confirmation bias, isn't it? It's always, I think it's always good to try and be aware of your own confirmation bias. Yeah. Like mine would be biomechanics. I just love that study, you know, and um, biomechanics is much more holistic now than it used to be. It used to be much more isolatory. Mm-hmm. And now we talk about the rest of the body. But I, at, at the same time, it's like someone could have faulty biomechanics and they will never have an injury. Yeah. Or they will never, mm-hmm. feel, like, you know, they never feel pain. So I guess like one of the other myths would be like, you know, you, you know, there's been loads of research papers about um, trying to link uh, sacroiliac joint dysfunction, let's say it doesn't move, um, and then how that might cause back pain. And um, I think for a lot of people that could be the case, like if the SIJ is a bit stiff, um, then that would potentially compromise how the lower back is moving. But at the same time, you know, you look at people and um, you can do MRI scans on people who have loads of back pain and they have no cl- clinical mm-hmm. issues, they have no biomechanical issues, um, you know, maybe it's something else. They don't like their spouse or they don't like their job and that's yeah. actually a higher, or they yeah. don't sleep very well, you know. Um, and then you have other people and they've got like, you know, they're say non-optimal biomechanics. Let's just say, you know, whatever. They've got a bit of disc degeneration, um, you know, even some bulges and they haven't got any back pain. Yeah. Do you know what's really interesting? So recently I showed you these videos before of all my non-union. When I post them on Instagram, there was a few of my friends because we are running a 10K oh, tomorrow. Cool. They're like, what are tomorrow you doing morning. running? Nice. Like, you shouldn't be running. You shouldn't be doing this. Like, how are you moving? And I was like, Ugh, like, whatever. I'm in no pain. I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. So I really, just to tie that all in, I really think that those myths have to do with, with your mind um, and what you think you can do. And if your mind's able to kind of go, well, actually, no, I'm good, then you mm. will be. Just mm. like these people who, uh, you know, 5'2", and they're like pro basketball players that can like jump and slam dunk um it's just that mm. your limiting beliefs and yeah many other things yeah you're right i mean you hear a lot about sports people saying like just belief i had belief in myself you were talking about the guy lifting the 5k the f- kilos and the 10 kilos and like if you think you can do it you'll get the output like the same as the at the opposite end of the scale if you're trying to squat a one rep max and you take 200 kilos off the off the 
rack and you suddenly go, this is heavy, I'm not going to be able to do this. It's not going to be as good as mm. if you go, I'm fired up, I'm ready to go, mm. I'm going to smack, I'm going to dominate this. And then you can push. Mm. And the only difference is your mindset. Mm. Like a friend of mine said to me a long time ago, I like, think about the best game of football you've had and the worst game of football you've had. Chances are the main difference there was your, your mindset that day. Mm. Like it's, you're the same body, mm. providing you're not like injured or hungover or super, super fatigued and exhausted. Mm. Chances are it's just your mind. Yeah. One day you were tuned in, you're on the ball, you're focused, you're motivated. The next day, mm. like you said, you were to your spouse or you're, you didn't sleep or whatever, you woke up and you just, I'm not, I don't want to be here today. Yeah, I always think of, um, you know, when you let's say they have the, um, the Olympics and you have like, the 100 meter race, or whatever. And then they interview like maybe the winner and then the second guy, the third guy. And then um, whenever they interview like, you know, the guy who came third and he wanted to come first or whatever, they say like, you know, what, what happened? You know, why didn't, why didn't you perform as well as you could do? And they never say, oh, I, you know, I should have done 10 more oysters before I did the race or I should have done like a few more squats. It's always like oh, my mind wasn't in the right place, yeah. I wasn't there. Mm. And obviously it's not to say that you shouldn't obviously physically train. But I think it's a, it's an element that we're, I, I think it's because we don't fully understand it. Yes. Like even with imagery, right? It's yeah. like we, we can talk about like, for example, with imagery, there's so many theories to why it might work. There's, there's the, um, the functional equivalence theory. So it's like if you imagine a movement, similar parts of the brain become activated as if you're doing it. That's like one theory. And then the other theory is the trickle down theory. So you image a movement and then muscles that would be active as if you were doing it would become a bit more engaged. But they're all just theories. All, all we mm. know is, is for some reason, if you have a electrical impulse in your mind that has a, a, an associated feeling or, a, or an emotion behind it or, or an intention that has a physiological effect on what? your heartbeat or your muscles. Mm. Or Sorry to interrupt you there. I was even going to say, even with Joe Dispenza's book, You Are the Placebo, mm. just looking at like physical things. So they give people physical sugar pills or mm. physical um, elements and these people miraculously get better. And, and I think one example that he explained was they would pretend to do surgery on someone. So they would actually cut their knee open, spend mm. the exact same amount of time They'd put music on, do everything else, talk as if it was a normal surgery, sew them up, nothing's done. And these people, after their rehab, would be like, yeah, my knee's so much better, that surgery was mm. amazing, like it healed me, et cetera, et cetera, mm. and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So it goes to show it's not just imagery, but there's a lot of research that shows that it, it's the imagery mm. and the perception. Um, so really, like our mind is so much stronger mm. and more powerful than we really give yep. it credit for, mm. um, much more than what we physically need to do mm. even though we physically need to to move but our mind's got to be on mm. board with that too and i think too like it's always i think one of the reasons why it's only talked about more now because athletes have known this forever like it's just kind of intuitive like yeah if, if, if i'm not in the right mindset i'm just not going to train today and that's going to have a knock-on effect for the next 10 years but i think like it's you know it's easy in like a magazine or like a post on facebook you can say like oh no three best exercises for the glutes or three top tips for like losing weight but it's actually harder to be like three best you know thoughts for this or three yeah. best mm. images and it's i think you, you could obviously do an article like that but it's almost more esoteric and it's it's, a, it's you can't see your mind can yeah. you? and, and that people aspect. think it's new agey that you're going to meditate you that you're going to yeah, you know, yeah that you oh yeah. just imagine yeah just imagine <laughs> that you're doing amazing imagine yeah, that you're yeah, strong yeah. and it's like the people who can get away with going super fluffy are the people who've achieved like I can't say, hey guys, imagine all that stuff. Because mm -hmm. what have I done? I'm just talking garbage. If Arnold Schwarzenegger walks mm -hmm. in here and starts talking to me about like you've got to imagine mm -hmm. the thing happening, and I'm just like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm I'm in 100. Mm -hmm. percent mm -hmm. Like y that gets fluffy by almost charlatans. Yeah, 100. percent I know? totally agree with that. But then when yeah. you have a when you have somebody who's climbed Mount Everest 15 times, you're like, okay, because mm. it's grounded in results. Yeah, mm. rather than it being like. Now I'm a flower. Now what? Like yeah. I'm just imagining, that, or, or it's just like you know, or it can just be like very um, like a like repetitive kind of. Yeah. Like you just hear it all the time, and it's just. It's like oh, yeah, another yeah. insta person mm. like parading it's bullshit. A, it's a funny one with the, with the surgery one too, actually. So we obviously the placebo effect of the um, being cut open in the mm. back, and then um, what one of the um, one guy did a really interesting study where he because they were saying oh, there is a definite placebo effect with that. But they are wondering how much of it is placebo, which is probably very dominant, and also how much of it is a lot of people don't like to exercise, right? And if someone's got to do a rehab um, uh, for like their back, they're more likely to do the rehab if they do pay money for surgery that was a fake surgery, 
and now they've got to then do the exercise because mm. it's, it's more like, well, now you've had the surgery, you've got to do it now. So they were almost looking at it from a physical aspect as well, which I thought was really interesting. Like obviously mm. there's that placebo effect like I've had the surgery, but they were, they were wondering how much of those results were also, those positive results were also coming from, well, now they've had the surgery, the, the, the fake surgery, they've actually now got to follow up with the exercise, which might have been the thing that got them out of the pain. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's very mm. interesting because I'm sure it's a bit of both. Um, yeah, definitely. But so it's fascinating, that kind of thing. It like, goes back yeah. to what you said at the beginning about trying to create that emotional impact through the imagery or through the, like, they've imagined the doc's gone in and fixed that in their mind. They've gone under the under the anesthetic. That's that emotional hit for them, and they're right, this is it, they've got to go and do it. Mm. But yeah, I think it's important, like, as an industry, uh, going forward, like, whether it's yoga, Pilates, rehab, you know, doctors, is to not have these, like, um, I guess, like, kind of... Uh, broad br brushes of like what we think a person should look like or move like you know like um again like we were saying before we started recording like you know we talk a lot about so one thing i, I study a lot of is like injury prevention um or you, i guess you can't say injury prevention like preventing the risk of injury because you can't really prove you, you prevented something that hasn't happened you know so can, yeah. can we like prevent the risk and then it's an interesting one because you know if you can really find out the risks then that, that's in a way gold dust because then you can you can you know you can um What's the right word? You can you can have that hindsight and try and work out. Okay, we're going to do this to prevent this, but then that also is flawed because at the same time people walk around with like really pronated feet um, and they never get you know a tibia stress fracture or they never get you know plantar fasciitis, but but then some people do have like over pronation and then they do get that, and so the the mechanisms of, in, of injury aren't like we were saying for everything. It's not black and white at all. It's it's kind of depends on the individual again and multifaceted yeah mm. exactly yeah so it's mm. an, it's interesting like i think that's why maybe there's a bit of the, with the communication between different uh, professionals you know like uh, whether it's medical or exercise is because there is no well this is the answer for this yeah th then it's like the, the discussion has to become much more almost longer and it's more in depth mm. yeah but it does require people to i think not look for simple truths yeah but i think the problem is sometimes there are simple truths no, like well, particularly when you when yeah. you throw in money and insurance into those things, then it starts to make and things ego. A bit, yeah, murky. and ego yeah. of people mm. who spend twenty five years studying topic A, and then science comes along and goes, all right, uh, well, we actually know this now. So, where are you standing on that topic mm. A? And the per does the person say, oh right, well, yeah, now I see it. I sorry about the last twenty five years. Let's do this idea. Mm. Chances are they don't they hold fast in that position and they go, nope, we must continue this way. And then you get this separation because I find that in the nutrition realm quite a lot. Mm. People who are holed up 10, 15 years ago selling one idea, like you're still pushing that. Whereas these new people are pushing something different. Who do we listen to? Mm. And you just make it so confusing. Mm. Yeah, it, yeah, 100%. I think, yeah, I think when there's ego, I mean, and that's, I think in any industry, isn't there? There's always going to be that. Um, yeah, and I, I think a lot of it is like um, you want to like I don't know. Yeah, you, you what was that quote? I'm trying to think of the quote now. It's like um, oh, I can't remember the quote now, but it's all about basically like rather than trying to uh, be like a disciple to one teaching and like like like, like, like I don't know. For example, like contrology, like old school Pilates, like that's the way forward. It's kind of like that's really interesting and that's got some really good elements to it, and it's really valid even today. That you know, back in the 40s, that that's st still got some vali validity to w how we work with people. But then also there's been like 70 years of things post that and then the, you know yoga is great and dance is brilliant and rehab and it's kind of like you know oh, being a student of everything isn't it yeah mm. and being open um and trying to try and get rid of that confirmation bias i think because i and i definitely have my own confirmation biases like you know imagery and exercise like i think that's like really yeah exciting but there's other things we have to look at as well like you were saying it's multifaceted isn't it all these mm. things yeah cool i think yeah it's a good point to end on it just is a good be point a student to end of on. everything and just keep learning and just expose yourself to everything that you can and yeah find hold on to what you like hold on to what works for you hold on to what makes sense and try not listen to the charlatans <laughs> try and listen find to arnie. try and find the first yeah listen to arnie schwarzenegger <laughs> yeah. forever he's got he's got a lot of things right yeah <laughs> he'll teach you <laughs> cool okay so tom where can people get a hold of you online social media stuff what are you active on and websites and stuff yeah mostly on facebook and instagram so my instagram page is uh tw dot bio movement therapy so that's loads of videos loads of articles on just like everything we talked about really and then same with facebook so that's tom waldron 
uh, biomechanics and movement therapy. So that's more like a lot of Facebook Live stuff and going into a bit more detail with certain clinical problems or just more information on biomechanics, really. Um, that's those are my two main platforms at the moment. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for coming to speak to us. I know you've got a busy yeah, weekend thanks, teaching ahead yeah, of you, so best you. of luck with that. And uh, yeah, next time you're in the bar, I hope you come speak to us again. Cool. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was fun. Amazing. Bye. Bye. Bye.